Good morning, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome to our ergonomic risk assessment webinar for the manufacturing sector. Uh, so I hope you all can hear me clearly and uh, thank you for attending this webinar today. I think we still have some people coming into the, um, some participants coming in to the event. So uh, we might just wait a, a minute or two uh, for other people to join. So we've got about 55 people in. So we'll just wait a second if that's okay. And then we'll kick off um, with the webinar. So thank you for that. Okay, uh, look at the numbers are coming in, so I think we'll kick off. Uh, you're all very welcome to the uh, 2021 series of ergonomic risk assessment webinars. Uh, this one is primarily focused on the manufacturing sector, but if you're from other sectors, you're all very welcome as well. Uh, just before we kick off this morning and go through the agenda, I just have some housekeeping points just to point out. Firstly, uh, uh, we will uh, have question and answer session at the end of uh, all the presentations and if you want to um, ask a question or if you want to put in a question you can put them in during the session but I would urge you to to use the Q&A function and you can find the Q&A function at the bottom right corner beside the chat function there's three dots and if you click on that there's a Q&A function there if you select the Q&A function you can put your question in there and we'll get to those questions at the end of the session. Um, my colleague Barry as well has also put a link on the under the chat function uh, to the uh, to the to the a chat function. They've put the link to the Mac tool, um, which will be used as part of the webinar this morning by Eta Layden. Um, so just in terms of the uh, other points, uh, the. Uh, Recording will be made of this webinar and will be available towards the end of next week. Um, we will also uh, make available the uh, link to that at a later stage. Finally, in terms of housekeeping, you will get a, a survey at the end of the webinar and we would urge you to fill that out because we're always looking for feedback on how we can improve our webinars. So in terms of the uh, agenda for this morning, um, I'll uh, be introducing uh, the uh, First presentation, I'll be presenting on managing ergonomic risk, current strategies and interventions. I'm a senior ergonomist and inspector with the Health and Safety Authority, and I work closely with colleagues around the country. I also work with uh, many organizations around the country. I, I carry out inspections looking at ergonomic issues. I've been doing that for over 20 years. Um, following my presentation, then, I know what, what I do in that presentation is give an overview of where we're at in the Health and Safety Authority in terms of how we think it's important to manage these risks. Then I'll hand over to uh, Christine Kelly, who you'll meet uh, at a later stage, and she she is going to present on a case study, a very interesting case study in the uh, uh, manufacturing sector, uh, which relates to ergonomic issues and maintenance. Following Christine's presentation, then I will introduce you to Ita Layden, and Ita is going to be introducing you to the uh, manual handling assessment charts, the MAC tool, which is developed by the HC in the UK. As I said, the link to that tool is available because uh, it's important to download that because ETA will be re referring to that uh, tool during the, uh, uh, I suppose, the workshop workshop part of this, uh, this webinar. So without further ado, I think uh, what I'll do is I'll just go through, I suppose, the Health and Safety Authority's uh, approach to managing ergonomic risk, current strategies and interventions. First thing I have to say is, uh, you know, we have legislation with respect to manu man managing manual handling risk. It's been there for many, many years. Part of that regulation really is that employers are duty bound to manage manual handling risk. So this means that th they need to be considering uh, how, how they're going to understand what aspects of manual handling take place in their workplace. Uh, they need to be able to collect important technical information, including load weight data, information on work area setups. They need to be able to use evidence-based risk assessment tools to identify risk factors and, and, and then based on that, identify what are the risk exposures in terms of high risks or very high risks and addressing those by putting appropriate measures in place to address those risk factors. And one of the important things I've said, uh, because even the last couple of days I was out on inspection in the manufacturer sector, 
And one of the things I've said is that risk management is core in terms of addressing manual handling issues in workplaces. Uh, but if you're, in terms of, uh, I suppose, lead indicators or key performance indicators, we shouldn't always uh, rely on, you know, the rate of injuries or the rate of illnesses, uh, because sometimes these uh, these cases, you know, these uh, injuries or illnesses may not occur overnight. They may be over cumulative uh, situations, the cumulative injuries, and they may not develop until a period of time. So what I think is a very useful key performance indicator is to be able to determine what your risk exposures are. And the, the tools you're going to meet, you're going to be looking at today, particularly the Mac tool, uh, that is very useful because the, there are score sheets that you use as part of using these risk assessment tools, which will identify where the risk exposures are. So the, based on that, then you can have a fair idea of what the risk, risk exposures are for different types of manual handling activities taking place in your workplace. I also just refer there to general principles of prevention in the act, because in there it talks about the importance of avoiding risk, evaluating unavoidable risks, adapting work to the individual. And that's that's critical in terms of our approach. We can't depend on the delivery of manual handling training alone to solve our issues in relation to manual handling. We have to consider and study very carefully the type of work people are doing. So what do we mean by ergonomic risk management? We're talking about the need for management to commit to addressing ergonomic risk and providing the required resources. And a simple thing, as I said yesterday to one of the companies I visited, one way of doing this as well is in, within your safety statement or your health and safety management system, it's a good idea maybe to develop a manual handling policy. And within that policy, you can use that as a statement of intent in terms of how you plan as an organization to manage er ergonomic risk, to manage manual handling risk. What are you going to do? Who will be responsible? Uh, so that's one part of the ergonomic management, ensuring those responsible for purchasing equipment and the design of the workplaces understand the importance of addressing ergonomic risk from the beginning of a project. And this is particularly important in the construction sector, which uh, we'll be covering next week. Taking steps to understand the nature of work uh, in the workplace. So even in, in, when I was visiting the workplaces in the last two days, one of the first things I asked about was the flow process in the organization. What kind of activities take place? What are the human elements within those activities? What are the potential manual handling aspects in, in the jobs in different areas of the work work environment? So that's important and that's part, that's that's critical in the risk assessment process. To develop competencies in managing ergonomic risk by using appropriate risk assessment tools, uh, such as the HSE MAC tool and RAP tool and R tool. The health and safety authorities recommending these tools. We cannot tell people to use these tools. However, we think it's a good idea to use them because there's a lot of science behind them. They're evidence-based and they're very user-friendly. So ergonomic risk management is also about developing innovative engineering or organizational interventions, consulting, consulting with staff, communicating with staff, that's a critical aspect, implementing appropriate measures and providing relevant training and development, such as training in the use of new equipment or even training in the, the development of a new SOP or method statement in, in terms of what improvements are put in place. So we know that ergonomics in its legal context uh, comes into the, you know, the, the Act, the 2005 Safety, Health and Welfare at Work Act, which uh, identifies duties in terms of providing safe systems of work, safe places of work. We've got the manual handling of load regulation, which is very core in terms of uh, what we're talking about here today. And then we have, again, ergonomics in relation to the display screen equipment and particularly the whole area of remote working, which is an area we've covered before in other webinars. And again, webinars, we have recordings of all our webinars. We have recordings in relation to remote work webinars that we've done in the past. You can see it on our website. So if you look at all those pieces of legislation, it's all about risk management, avoidance of risk, prevention of risk to health at work, using appropriate means, evaluating unavoidable risk. So they, these, they, these are core elements, and this is why we lo are looking at these tools here today. So if we look at a simple example of what we mean by risk management, this is a case study, a company down in Shannon, the individual here, the job involved uh, transferring parts into a machine, okay? So the task description there is pretty much what I've just said. So the technical information there would be relating to the work or the, the uh, weight of the loads. In this case, it was up to 70 to 80 kilos in weight. It was a uh, frequent enough to operation uh, that you can see there there's uh, issues in relation to posture. So, you know, by collecting information like that and collect, uh, taking photos and taking video where appropriate and, and certainly by getting permission of those that do the job, you can collect, uh, uh, get a good indication in terms of what needs to be done, particularly by using the risk assessment tool. 
Now, I know you probably haven't seen this yet, but you will be seeing it later on when Ita talks about the uh, Mac tool. This is an example of a score sheet for uh, the Mac tool. And this is a score sheet for the particular task we've just looked at there. And you can see there, it, it gives different risk factors on the left and then it gives a color code in terms of the risk level. So we can see there, there's one purple and there's three reds, one amber, three greens. So again, getting back to what I said in terms of risk exposure, we can see there's four significant risk exposures there. So you could actually tabulate for different tasks. You could, you could actually quickly find out to tabulate what are the number of risk exposures in the organization with respect to different tasks. And that kind of identifies clearly to us that this activity involves risk. So if that's the case, then the uh, employer is duty bound to manage that risk. And that's, that's really where we're coming from today. So then in this case, for example, the solution was developed for the innovative solution. The individual that's in this photo here, this was an idea that he had. So the organization employed engineers and others to work with him to come up with that solution. So I suppose that's the that's that's what we want. That's the model we're looking for, and that's really what we're looking for in terms of you know um, uh, quality of of risk assessment uh, in organisations. Because you know for us, that, if these tools are being used, it, it, it's a very clear indicator to us that the organisations are effectively managing these risks. So from the health and safety authorities' point of view, over the last six seven years, there's been very clear emphasis on the importance of managing uh, uh, health risks in the workplace. Uh, so, looking at increasing knowledge and understanding of occupational health risks around musculoskeletal injury and illnesses, raising awareness of the value of controlling these health risks, promoting positive health and well-being, and ensuring legal compliance through proportionate enforcement. So, from an ergonomics perspective, we've done a number of things uh, to move that strategy on. Firstly, we've looked at developing the competency of all our inspectors who are in the field, who are looking at workplaces every day. Uh, so that they have a better recognition of what manual handling risks are. So they have received training, at least 70 of our inspectors in the last five years have received training in the use of the risk assessment tools, the MAC tool, the, the RAP tool, from the HSE UK themselves directly. Uh, so that, that has been a very useful experience and, and, and that means then the inspectors are in a position that when they go and visit a workplace, if they see something that they have concerns about, they can raise it and they can ask the right types of questions, such as, well, I observe here that there's an activity taking place here where potentially there could be risk. What are you doing about it? What, what, how are you managing those risks? So apart from that, we're also, again, doing the, the workshops and the webinars, which we're here today. And we're going to continue to do that because we want to get the message out there, not just to our inspectors, but also to everybody else so that we can share this knowledge and experience uh, to, with everyone. So, you know, we started the workshops in 2017 and in the physical workspace. Uh, but in the last year or two, you know, because of the pandemic, we've done the webinars and they've worked quite well. So, uh, you know, the idea really is to give the hands on tools and to share experiences and ask questions and, and really to, 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 to work together to, to figure out what's the problem, what's not a problem. And that's really ultimately what the tools are about is, is, is really measuring and then working to come up with solutions. So we've also done a lot of work in developing specific guidance documents. The guidance in the middle there, managing ergonomic risk to improve musculoskeletal health. That's a diet, uh, the guidance we just published over 12 months ago. That guidance is very much uh, reflective of, uh, you know, the risk assessment process and the incorporation of the use of the different risk assessment tools. Within that guide, I think it would, you would have received a link, uh, you know, when you signed up for this uh, workshop uh, webinar. Within that guidance, uh, page 14 to 18 are probably the most important pages in that document because that's where it explains the, the risk assessment process from step one to step five. So step one, task description. Step two, collecting the technical information. Step three is using the actual tools, such as the MAC tool and the RAP tool, and then uh, to identify what the risks are. And then step four is coming up with solutions. And lastly, step five, reviewing the effectiveness of solutions and working with those that do the job and then providing training in whatever solutions come up. So. Other work we've done is developing case studies with companies, and these, these uh, in a lot of cases, come about as, as a result of referrals from uh, colleague inspectors. So you can see there, there's one there from a company called Organic Lens Manufacturing, or Essilor, and that's Christine, and she's going to be presenting on that case study here this morning. You see the other one is a construction-related one with JJ Ratkin Construction, and again, they will be presenting on that case study at our webinar next week. 
also in terms of inspection focus, you know, uh, I suppose we had a strategy for looking at health issues in construction and health sector from 19, 2019 to 21. Some of that work stalled as a result of the pandemic, but there will be increased emphasis on, on these issues in, in those sectors into 2022. And certainly in the construction sector, we're going to be running an inspection blitz, blitz in the construction sector from uh, October 26th to November 12th this year, focusing on work at height and managing ergonomic risk. Okay, so just to, to finish off, I mean, you know, I said yesterday, you know, uh, I was on site and these are some of the questions that I would have asked the, the employers yesterday uh, and, and in previous situations. And these are questions you need to ask yourself if you have a potential issue with manual handling risk. So you have to ask what type of manual handling activities are carried out? What, where are loads being handled? And what are the steps involved in moving a load? Have you information on load weight specifications of loads and other relevant information in terms of the work environment setup? Can you provide documented evidence that ergonomic risk factors, such as load too heavy, lifted away from the body, posture, have they been identified and are you managing those risks? Can you provide evidence that the ergonomic risks are being managed uh, by using appropriate uh, equipment or changing the way that work is done to reduce the risk of exposures? So that's my presentation in terms of yeah, today, you know, thanks again for coming on. We've got over 105, 106 participants today, which is fantastic. I just say, you know, after your workshop webinar today, you know, go away and try out the tools. Don't be afraid to use them. You know, uh, you know, I, I've recommended a number of companies and I know in the health sector, a number of organizations we've dealt with have, have incorporated the use of these risk assessment tools into their health and safety management system. Look at work activities in your workplace, uh, consult with others. Uh, refer to our website, uh, there's a lot of very useful information on the workplace health on our website and enjoy the webinar. So that's really, you know, that, that's my uh, closing presentation, just to give you the context of where we're coming from here today. So that's uh, that's that. So what, what I'm going to do now, because you you actually is going to uh, change over the presentation. Uh, while Hugh is doing that, I'm going to just introduce our next speaker, which is Christine Kelly from SLR, our organic lens manufacturing um, in County Clare. And Christine has kindly been involved with our webinars for the last number of years. And, uh, you know, the work, the, the, the work they're doing there in ergonomics is very, very, very interesting. Uh, Christine is a, an environmental health and safety coordinator and an ergonomic specialist. Uh, she has a BSc in environmental studies, UCC, and a master of technology, safety and ergonomics from the University of Limerick. And she's a member of the Irish Human Factors and Ergonomics Society. So, Christine, if you would just want to put up your 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 video there, or put on your video there, and I'll hand over to you if that's okay. Um, Christine. Yep. So um, what, just. What that's great. Okay. Can okay. my video actually isn't coming on? Oh, here we go. Okay. Hello, and thanks very much, Frank. So, um, I'm just going to talk generally a little bit about our ergonomic, um program in organic lens and I will talk a little bit about some case studies in maintenance but I'll also talk a little bit how we integrate ergonomics into the lean approach so um yeah I'll just tell you a little bit about Essler so actually Essler we're now called Essler Luxottica we're now an Italian French company multinational with um, sites all over the world. So we specialize in manufacturing ophthalmic lenses, in manufacturing equipment for opticians and in um, labs, which put coating and different, um, yeah, they frame the glasses. So basically uh, we manufacture semi-finished lenses. They're sent to various labs around Ireland and then they're exported to the European market. So we're based in Ennis and Clare, and I suppose we have 300 people working here at the moment. And one thing that we have to consider, especially in relation to ergonomics, is that we have an aging population. So the average age of our workforce is 45. So that's a big consideration. We have another company in Tune, Transitions Optical, so you may know the glasses that change when you look at sunlight, they darken. Now, this uh, company is mostly R&D, and then the other companies on the map are basically labs. 
that put the coatings and frames on your glasses. So we're based in Ennis. The company opened in 1991. I've said about the average age of our employees. And as well as manufacturing, we have a distribution centre. So our main ergonomic risks would be um, repetitive task. We have a lot of pushing and pulling. And then we have all the risks that are associated with the distribution centre. OK, so um, I started the ergonomic programme in about 2012. Um, so it's become an essential part of business within organic lens. So we look at ergonomic assessments and what's really what we really try to focus on is ensuring participation of employees performing the task in the changes from design stage, risk assessment stage to post implementation. So if any of you are on the lean journey, where the objective is to reduce non-value added activity for the customer, this can lead to work intensification. And unless this is managed properly with ergonomic consideration, it can lead to work intensification, which can lead to an increase in musculoskeletal disorders. So it's really, really important to consider that if you're on the lean journey. And then, so ergonomics can contribute beneficially to standardised work also, which is an objective of the lean journey, by eliminating unnecessary handling. Um, you know, sometimes people, I know in our place, sometimes people, we have a, a one task where you have to blow a lens. And the question we asked when we looked at, looked at the various different techniques, some people blowed seven times. Some people blow three times, some people blow once. So we had to decide, well, how many times do the person doing the work need to blow the lens? Because the extra blowing can lead to extra muscular fatigue. So also we try to create a natural flow of work. So people are working from left to right, right to left in a natural sequence. Uh, we look at the reach zones in line with ergonomic principles. And we try to reduce uh, variability, but we also we always have to consider with humans, human factors, there will always be a certain amount of variability. And we have to allow for that too. So the key elements of the ergonomic program are early intervention, okay, especially at design stage. When we get new equipment on site, when we do a machinery acceptance, ergonomics is a key part of the machinery acceptance. During management of change, we have protocols for making sure ergonomics is considered. And then we have to drive continuous improvement. We develop an ergonomic roadmap every year with a schedule of ergo risk assessments with, and this encourages strong participation of all employees. We communicate on our successes of ergonomics so that people can see the benefits of the improvements we put into place. We do a lot of internal benchmarking between different departments to show the importance and the success of ergonomic improvements. I also lead an ergonomic technical group within Essler Luxottica for America, North and South and for Europe. And it's very good at helping to drive improvement and to allow us all to benchmark and not reinvent the wheel when we have similar processes. And another thing we have is an early reporting of pain. There was a bit of resistance at the beginning to this because, you know, it, it's quite difficult um, when you start an ergonomic program. But it has been key to the success of our ergonomic program because we can follow up and make changes faster for all employees if they have an issue. OK, so as Frank said in the guidance documents, there is a risk assessment methodology, and this is what we follow. So in step three, we include Mac, RAP, or ART. Okay, and then, yeah, so we include people. So as I said before, we try to encourage employee participation. We have a suggestion system, and people put in ergonomic safety suggestions. If a suggestion is implemented, they get like a prize a sports bag, a hoodie. We have a catalogue um, and people can choose something. 
there's also a suggestion of the quarters. So if they win that, they win another prize. So it, it drives momentum. In our daily stand up meetings, we have, um, yeah, safety and ergonomic issues can be raised. We have behavioral safe based safety audits, and sometimes we use the Mac or the RAP tool extracts out of that to help us with our behavioral based safety audits and auditors are trained on that. And then another thing on the lean journey again, I find the Kaizen is a really Kaizen has changed for good and it, it encourages um, participation of employees. And I find it is very friendly towards ergonomic improvement. So, for instance, when we do an ergonomic Kaizen, what we focus on are the people. So, basically, you know, we ask the people, what do you like about this job? What do you find difficult? Usually an ergonomic Kaizen is done after an ergonomic risk assessment. So, if we find we have ergonomic risk factors, we try to run a Kaizen. So, we take the people who are doing the job. We also take some people from outside the job, like maintenance, who can help us make changes straight away. And other people like IT are from a different area in production to give us a fresh eye. So when we look at, um, oh yeah, I'll come back to that. So this is just one example of a Kaizen, like this is in our distribution. So we identified the risk factors. We had a pallet um, delivered from Asia and it was piled too high. So you can see I have an extract from the Mac tool on overreaching. And basically what we did, we uh, liaised with the people sending us the pallet and we asked them, um, could they reduce the height of the pallet? And what they came up with, because when you're shipping, you know, you want to get as much onto a pallet as possible. By basically looking at the layout of the boxes on the pallet, they were able to give us the same quantity, but reduce the height. So you can see the max score before was red. After the improvement, we did an assessment and the max score was green. Ita will be telling you about this. Another thing in the distribution center, we have a lot of cages for pushing and pulling. And, you know, due to participation of the employees, they told us that, you know, some of the trolleys were really difficult to push and pull and um, awkward to manipulate around corners. So we worked with our supplier, um, Brammer, who suppliers with casters, and we did a trial in a few different um, casters. And eventually we found one that is really, really, really making a big difference to how people push and pull. So when you think the main risk we're pushing and pulling is at the start, initiating the push of the pull, it's really important that this aspect of the job is made easy. So yeah, we got really positive feedback. So yeah, it's a really important step that maybe you might not think about to look at the casters. Oh, this is just something that came up. Employees wanted a space um, to be able, like employees on the floor don't have access to PCs. And we have what's called SLA University, where employees can engage in short training programs. So what we did is we developed um, a, an IT pod, a, a computer pod, um, where people can come up, book the room, sign on for a training course. Now, because we have very limited space, these pods were designed um, that they're you know, they're very self-contained, they open up. We looked at ergonomic principles, they're lightweight, they're attached to the wall. And, you know, it has given a sense of employee satisfaction now that we've listened and we have created something that they are happy with. Oh, we're back to a Kaizen. Yeah, so this is just another example of a Kaizen we did in the DC. So I don't know if you can see, I just wanted to show you this. What I do usually when I do the risk assessment on the top left, I do the steps of the ergo assessment. And what I do then is I create a storyboard of the tasks, because what I find is to get momentum going. Um, it's a great communication tool when you're talking to the managers of the different production areas to visually show them what the risk factors are. I use the Mac. Uh, 
rate, score rating the Little Red Man also. And um, yeah, I find it's a really good uh, communication tool to have the storyboard combined with the Mac wrap or art tool. So what I've shown here on the bottom left is just what we do in the Ergokaizen. So based on the risk assessment, we've identified our problem. So with an Ergokaizen, you're there to solve a problem. So we brainstorm on the ideal state and we considered the ideal state to reduce risk factors and also to meet the needs of the people working on the site based on what I said before, what do they like, what do they don't, what don't they like? And then we prioritize the tasks based on impact and feasibility. We put actions into place and then we review. I just have um, an example here of a Kaizen in consolidation where space was really restricted for the person um, lifting pallets off the conveyor, conveyor onto a pallet. They didn't have enough room to face the load when lifting because of the space restrictions. So basically the Kaizen helped us reorganize the work area with very little expense and we could do it all internally so that we created a lot of more space. We created a more ideal um, um, desk and um, now the operator has a lot more room. It seems very simple, but I suppose the Kaizen doesn't, it depends on the scope of your Kaizen also. I try to keep ergonomic Kaizen defined, you know, within a limited scope so we can do a lot more actions. Okay, so this is then back to design stage prototypes. So when we were developing um, a conveyor line, a single piece flow line, we worked on prototypes. So what we did basically, first of all, we drew up, um, you know, what we wanted to do it was a very simple prototype initially, and we had people test it out to see how it felt for them. And then we modified it as necessary. Then we actually built a temporary prototype where, you know, it operated. We had opening devices. We had everything. We had three people on the line to test and we ran it for an hour at a time. We got feedback from people. So eventually we were able to make modifications. I mean, we're continuously doing that too because we're always coming up with new issues. But by doing it at design stage, it has helped us and we've gained a lot of knowledge. Now, as Frank said, I'm going to talk about some maintenance tasks. So with maintenance, um, to find out, we encourage people to report what they find difficult. So maintenance um, did report a few issues and what's really important is to respond quickly and um, yeah, to show that, you know, changes can be made. And usually maintenance do have the solution. Um, so this is one where, and another thing is that maintenance ergonomic risk factors are often combined with other safety risk factors such as working at height. So this is a case where there's um, a motor at height above a tank of water, which is 30 degrees and access was very, very difficult. So if they used a step ladder, they may, they were standing on the side of the tank, not suitable at all. So what we did is we um, installed a platform. Um, so we, it, we installed one which could be hinged and flapped down with a safety ladder and a safety barrier. So now instead of having to bring equipment to the place um, to access the motor, it's there installed on site at the machine. And um, all they have to do is turn down the hinge step, walk up the ladder and they have access. Okay, another thing we did, which is the case study Frank mentioned. So. You know, as I said, we have an aging population and our maintenance population are an aging workforce. So um, before we made the modification, you can see the maintenance technician was kneeling down in a very limited space and could be in this position for an hour, an hour and a half, trying to uh, change the blades on a granulator. You can see the posture of his toes, very uncomfortable. And because um, he needed help, because when you're kneeling, it's very difficult to exert force 
sometimes he needed help from another person. So we had to look, as you can see, the space is very restricted. We have not much space between the steps and the wall. So, and this platform is used daily by other operators working in the area. So we had to come up with a solution that met the requirements of the people working in the area. And based on ergonomic principles, we decided we wanted to allow the maintenance person work in a standing position. So what we did is we modified the platform. It looks simple, but it took us a lot of time to think, how can we do this and not, um, you know, allow the platform to operate for everyone. So what we did is we installed a permanent platform underneath the existing one and the existing platform, we modified it so that a slot could be taken out then the operator could get up onto this platform and do the job while standing. So we put a safety gate at the top of the steps and we added a chain, um, you know, for safety also. So the feedback from the maintenance technicians, they were really, really happy. They found it was much easier to do the task and they also found the task, doing the task was more efficient. So that's what's published in the ergonomic case study. This was one of the first ones we did with the maintenance technicians. Our poly ovens, they're used for polymerization of the lenses. The electrical panels all had to be rewired and um, it was actually taking six months to do the rewiring. But because of poor design again, and um, you know, as the maintenance technicians said, if these panels were designed in mind for technicians to have to access, they would have been perpendicular to the oven instead of flat where the maintenance technicians had to reach. So the only way they could reach was with the step ladder. And you can see there weren't three points of contact, very unsafe, reaching over. It wasn't ideal at all. So we looked at purchasing some platforms um, off the shelf. But the problem with is that the stabilizers for these platforms, they splayed outwards. So when the maintenance technician was working on one oven, we had to shut down actually three ovens to perform the task on one oven. So what we did, we got a bespoke piece, a stand made up and it's very lightweight on wheels, made from aluminium and steel with protective barriers. So now the operator can stand upright, face the work and yeah, do it in a comfortable way. And this piece of equipment, when they're working on one oven, it's just the width of one oven. So if ovens beside either side need to be opened to be checked, that's possible. And then this was uh, another thing, I don't know, we had a machine installed um, on a conveyor for putting data matrix on the lens. However, um, yeah, when it came to the reality of the situation, when we did the ergonomics assessment at design stage, it was thought by everybody that maintenance would only have to access from the left. But in reality, they had to access from the right. And that was at the back of the conveyor. So they had to climb under awkward spots. So really, because we tweaked it very early on, we got maintenance involved. They actually drew up the solution. We got the conveyor company to come in, help modify the conveyor so that the machine could be taken out on a pallet truck and the maintenance people could stand in behind. The floor is marked because it's very sensitive. The machine has to be in exactly the right spot. But now it's really easy for maintenance to pull it out and push it back into place. So really, that's it. So what, what have we learned at Organic Lens Manufacturing? Well, we've learned that early integration of ergonomic principles during man management to change is key. And even though some maintenance tasks are very infrequent, um, the severity of the risk can be quite high you know, due to the consequences if, you know, something goes wrong. From a lean, from people who are on a lean journey, work intensification can increase the risk of injury. So we have to consider it when we're eliminating non-value added activity. 
Um, without the participation of people uh, during the ergonomic assessments and during the improvement, I don't think we'd be as successful. And, um, you know, it creates a really positive safety culture also. And yeah, then ergonomics can contribute beneficially to standardized work, as I said before. And that's it. Thank you. Christine, thank you very much for that, Christine. Uh, really appreciate that. That was a very interesting case study um, presentation, and there was a variety of different interventions there. So, as I said, uh, you know, we will do the question and answer at the at the end of the uh, the last presentation. So, I know I noticed there was a question there in the chat, but if you could put your questions into the Q and A so we can collate them, because my colleague Barry will go through those questions at the end of the session. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is introduce uh, our next speaker. Um, so um, I'll invite Ita. Yeah. Hi, Ita. Um, okay, so uh, Ita, I'll just tell you a little bit about Ita. She's the Managing Director of Laden, Laden Consulting Engineers, and she has uh, extensive experience as a chartered uh, consultant, ergonomist, and forensic engineer, but also a chartered member of the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health with 25 years experience in engineering and healthcare, lots of experience. So she uh, uh, kindly has worked with ourselves on these workshops and webinars over the last five years. So uh, before I hand over to Ita, I just wanna say one thing, we're gonna have a kind of a, a short comfort break halfway through Ita's presentation. And so I leave it to Ita to decide when that will take place, just for a minute or two, to give people an opportunity to get up, move about, get a glass of water, whatever they want to do. Okay, so I'll just hand over to you Ita. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Lovely. Thanks a million, Frank. It wouldn't be a good ergonomic uh, webinar if we didn't give people a, a chance to stand up and take a break from looking at their, their monitors. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you now through the manual assessment charts, and hopefully all, at this stage you've all had the opportunity to download the um, uh, publication from the hse.gov.uk website, uh, which we're going to be using um, as part of our workshop uh, practical element today. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about the um, suite of tools from the Health and Safety Executive, and then we're going to look at how we complete a MAC assessment. And you'll be given the opportunity um, within the next hour or so to try out the uh, tool, uh, MAC tool, for a lifting and for a carrying operation. So obviously, um, from both Frank's talk earlier on and, and the illustrations and examples Christine has given us, um, musculoskeletal disorders are, are obviously a very, very common type of occupational ill health, and we can do a lot to prevent them. But it's very important that when we are introducing uh, corrective actions or in making improvements, that we focus on the right factors or the right, uh, we fix the right things. So um, in that respect, the use of the MAC tool and the other HSE suites, such as ART and RAP, um, are very good at one, enabling us to carry out the risk assessment to identify where the risk factors are, and then help us to identify what corrective action we need to introduce to improve the ergonomic risks of particular tasks and activities. Uh, Frank has shown you these. So you have your MAC, RAP and ART. MAC stands for Manual Assessment Charts. RAP stands for Risk Assessment of Pushing and Pulling. And ART stands for Assessment of Repetitive tasks. So the ART tool is used for um, uh, tasks involving the upper limbs. Um, the RAP tool is, as the name suggests, used for pushing and pulling activities within manual handling. And the MAC is used for lifting, carrying, and for team uh, handling operations. And as Frank has mentioned, there are worked examples of these also in the HSA's publication from um, recent publication uh, from late last year regarding risk assessment for managing ergonomic risks. So in relation to the MAC tool, the most important thing when you're carrying out a risk assessment from an ergonomics perspective is to identify which um, assessment tool um, is best suited to the task that you're assessing um, or to the different elements of the task that you're assessing. And the MAC tool is the tool for um, manual um, handling, where there's a lifting task or a carrying task or a team handling task. And 
Um, it's not appropriate for some manual handling operations, such as pushing and pulling, in which case the wrap tool is better. And it's not suitable for um, manual handling tasks involving patients um, or patient handling. So um, in terms of, um, again, if there's upper limbs, again, you should be using the um, art tool or the uh, assessment of repetitive tasks tool. So I, I'm going to go back one slide because there is one thing that I do want to highlight to you. At this stage, I'm hoping that you have all uh, downloaded or have access to a copy of the printed version of the Mac tool. And um, those of you who want to go a little bit fancy, you can actually purchase smaller versions of the, the, the various tools from the hse.gov.uk website. But I'm a very practical and I've downloaded for free would be my preference. When you're using the Mac, this guidance document, what you'll see is as you flick through, the top of the pages have different colors. So you have a blue coloring or a blue band across the top of the uh, guidance document. And that's the guidance that you're going to use when you're carrying out a lifting operation. If you scroll or go as far as page eight, um, you'll see that the color band across the top changes to red. And that's the guidance that you would use for a carrying operation. And as you scroll through to page 13, the top band changes to a teal color because that's the guidance that you'll use when carrying out an assessment of a team based handling activity. So the initial step in carrying out a manual handling assessment is to identify whether or not the assessment using Mac is going to be sufficient or if you need to do a more detailed assessment. So the um, first part is to identify whether or not a full risk assessment is required. And you'll see this on the score sheet from the publication and your score sheet is on page 19 of 20. And on the right hand side of the score sheet, there's a section that says, do I need to do a full risk assessment? And here is where you would um, identify if the MAC tool is suitable. So you'd ask yourself, are activities involving lifting or lowering more than 12 lifts per hour? Or in other words, one lift every five seconds or carrying more than once every 12 seconds. So if it is, the MAC tool isn't going to be a suitable and sufficient um, assessment for that activity. Then the other uh, question that you'd ask yourself is, does the handling take place when someone is seated? If it does, um, and it involves more than five kilograms for men or three kilograms for women, again, the MAC tool isn't the suitable tool for a full and suitable sufficient risk assessment. If there's individual employees at significant risk, um, those who might be pregnant or young workers or anyone who has a predisposition, again, the MAC tool on its own may not be sufficient to carry out an assessment for those individuals. And then we have other factors that um, may indicate that the MAC tool is not suitable. And in the, the, on the score sheet and in your guidance document, you'll notice that they're referencing the UK legislation. The reason that they're referencing UK legislation is that these tools have to be developed by the health and safety executive in the UK. Um, and therefore, they, although they're used internationally, um, the guidance documents are um, only going to reference the UK legislation. Of course, prior to Brexit, um, the legislation had its uh, um, background in Europe anyway. So the, the requirements aren't very different between the UK and Ireland. However, the title of the legislation that's referenced may be slightly different. So here we talk about factors from Schedule 1 of the Manual Handling Operations Regulations. We have very similar in, of course, our own regulations here and general application regulations in Ireland. So if there's large vertical movements or there's risk of sudden movements of the load or um, if the work load is imposed by a process, it's a task which requires unusual strength um, or unusual height, or indeed the task requires information or training for its safe performance. Now that I mean is that there's specific training for one unique task. Um, well, then the MAC tool may not be the, the correct tool to use. Um, I should also reference at this stage that in there's a, a reference on your score sheet to L23 appendix. 
that again is the appendix to the UK's guidance to manual handling in the workplace. Um, so uh, the list that you have there is from that appendix that's referenced at the top of your score sheet. Also, what you need to consider when you're doing a MAC assessment, or at least record for consideration, I should say, are any psychosocial factors that may impact musculoskeletal ill health. And there are where you might have high workloads or tight deadlines or lack of control over the work and working methods. So how do we complete a MAC assessment? Well, we identify the task to be assessed and ideally choose the ones that you know to be hard or that there have been complaints about. And I think um, Christine's advice earlier on in relation to getting individuals to identify issues um, er, as early on as possible um, will certainly add to improving musculoskeletal health in the workplace uh, very, very uh, as quick, more quickly um, and very quickly rather than, than when it's too late. Then consult with employees uh, and the representatives about manual handling. So it is about engaging. This isn't something that you should be carrying out in a covert basis or without the knowledge of those involved because they're the ones who are going to give you the best information about the, um, the particular task or activity. And once you've done this, you then have identified what are we going to assess? And then you complete page one of your score sheet. So as I say, and you're on the, the printout, the PDF printout that's on page 19, um, of that. So the standard detail you'd include in your um, risk assessment, um, who's carrying out the assessment, um, details of the task and the activity, and indeed, when does the task take place? Because that's again important to consider, is it at the very beginning of the day or at the beginning of the shift when individuals' muscles haven't had a chance to warm up, or is it at the end of the shift, maybe when someone is more tired? And then the next part of the score sheet, you'll see that on the left hand side of the score sheet, it says, are there any indications that the task is a high risk? And here the task is a high, would be considered to be a high risk if there's a history of manual handling incidents, such as reportable accidents in respect of a particular task. And here again, they refer to RIDDOR. Now, again, most of you will be familiar with that term. It's uh, RIDOR refers to the reporting of injuries, diseases, and dangerous occurrences. And again, that's the UK's version of our um, uh, reportable accidents here in, in Ireland. So basically, if there is a history of reportable accidents or accidents that have to be reported to the Health and Safety Authority, that would give you a good indication that this particular task might be a high risk. If the task is known to be strenuous or can only be done by a few people in an organization, if employees doing the task appear to be uh, struggling. So uh, obviously, if you see somebody who is um, breaking out in a sweat or um, physically um, uh, struggling and it's obvious that they are when they're carrying out the activity, well, that's a very good indication that, listen, this is a high risk activity. Or if there's any other indications, again, you uh, um, capture them here as you would with any psychosocial factors. So. The most important part, once we have scoped what we are going to assess, is to observe. And you'll see this in a few moments when you get an opportunity to carry out the ass an assessment, is observation, observation, observation. You're going to see the lifting video or the, 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 the task that we're going to show in a video in a few moments. You're going to see it at least three times um, before you should actually start to carry out the assessment. Um, in terms of the observation, uh, videoing can be very helpful here, of course, but we do need to be cognizant of the GDPR requirements in relation to that. Always get permission um, and indeed develop your recording skills. If you are using um, video recording, um, uh, there's a, there is a skill involved of making sure that you've captured the various angles and you've captured the correct information to analyze at your desk perhaps later on. Then you select the appropriate type of assessment. So is it a lifting, carrying or team? So are you starting with the red bannered uh, guidance as in the document? Are you going to the blue or are you going to the, uh, the teal? If the task involves lifting and carrying, which some might, well then you'll be actually doing two assessments. You'll be using the guidance for a lifting or the lifting element of the task. And then you'll be using the guidance for the carrying for the carrying element of the task. Then 
all one very nice thing about the, the HSE suite of assessment tools is that they're all based on a process flow. And it's just a matter of following the process flow as you go through and um, uh, carrying out the assessment at each step and then recording your observations at each step. Again, all of the suites use a numbering system and a, a color code system with our, again, your normal, your green, amber, and red for the low, medium, and high levels of risk. But what we are introducing here with MAC is a what we call a purple risk. And a purple risk basically uh, would be off the Richter scale. So it's really a very high level of risk. And if something falls into the high risk category, um, uh, it would be very wise to stop that activity and change it um, immediately. And then we enter the information and we calculate the total exposure risk as we go through and we identify then what uh, corrective actions or risk factors we need to focus on. So just to give you a show, uh, um, uh, an example here, Frank also showed one earlier on for the um, uh, example that he had, but this is a sample completed score sheet. So your score sheet is on page 20 of 20. So again, this is your score sheet in, in paper form. And what you'll see on your score sheet is each of the risk factors that you're assessing are in the first column. And then you have a color band columns for a lift. So, uh, and you have a numerical score for a lift a carry or a team. So if, for example, we're looking for a, at a lifting task, what we will do is we will assess, our first step is going to be assess the load weight and frequency. We're going to use the guidance in the, uh, the uh, guidance document for Mac. And based on the guidance, we're going to assign a color and a score to load weight and frequency risk factor. So for a lift, we, you can, if you get fancy, you can use your color markers and have a red, amber, green, and purple. Um, but for simplicity, I would normally use, when I'm using a paper version, I would normally use just the letter R, A, G, or P to represent the color. So we assign a color and then we assign a, um, a number. So the color goes into column one, sorry, the second column for the, um, the lift, and the color, uh, or sorry, I should say the, the score then goes into the fifth column under the lift um, heading. Um, and then we would do the same if we're doing a carrying all the way down through each of the risk factors. One point I do want to make here is that when you are doing the, uh, using a MAC assessment, there is a total score that is calculated. But unusually, for those who are used to risk assessment, the final score doesn't give us any indication of the overall level of risk. Your traditional approach to risk assessment is that you calculate an overall score, and then that score tells you whether something is a high, medium, or low risk. The nature of manual handling is that each individual risk factor could result in a, an injury or musculoskeletal ill health on its own. So when we're doing a MAC, we only look at each individual risk factor. And if one of those is a red, well, then the risk associated with that activity is a red. So why then do we have this total score calculation at the end of the score sheet? We have that there just to maybe prioritize the um, actions or prioritize which tasks we're going to focus on. So those with the higher score, we would then, um, if we have a limited amount of resource, we'd focus on the ones with the higher score first, and then look within that at which risk factor needs to be addressed. So here's the flowchart for the lifting operations. So I'm going to ask you all to go to, we're looking at the blue and we're going to ask you to go to page seven of 20. So on your page seven, you'll see that there is a flowchart there and this is for lifting operations. And as you go through, we start and we assess the load weight frequency. We then look and we assess the hand distance from the lower back. And for each risk factor, there is guidance in the document. So we're going to start by looking at what do we consider when we're assessing load weight and frequency. And we go to our assessment guide and our assessment guide for load weight and frequency is on page three of your workbooks. So on page three of your workbooks, you'll see this graph. And what this graph allows us to do is to determine what score and what color is associated with the particular lift. 
So I'm going to give you an example. If I have to lift a 25 kilogram load once per day, what band and color would that fall into? So I go along my uh, X axis there and I find the weight. So the weight of the load is 25. And I then go across the, um, the other axis and I look at the lifts per day or the lifts, uh, um, the, the lifts per hour. So one lift per day at 25 kgs is in the amber band. So that would get a, a color of, a, of amber and a score of four. So in filling out my score sheet under the lift column, under the first, uh, across the risk factor for uh, load weight frequency on that row, I would put in A for amber and then three columns over under the score element, I'll put in a four. The next thing we look at is actually, sorry, just one thing I should mention on that. Um, one thing I should mention on this is that this is where the purple risk comes into place. So if somebody has to lift 50, 60 kil kilograms once per day, that would be a purple risk. And that wouldn't be a, 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 considered to be a safe lift for an individual in a workplace situation. Um, the other thing I want to mention here is that there's a, always a question as to whether, how does this correlate to our um, HSA guidance, as we would have referred to it previously, where you have the, the man and the woman outline and you have the 25 kgs held close to the upper torso, 10 kgs with arms outstretched, 3 kg, or 5 kgs with arms outstretched above shoulder height. Um, this correlates quite well with that, but that initial is a guidance um, in terms of um, what's generally acceptable as a lift for 95% of the population. Um, this a uh, HSE assessment guide then goes one step further to identify um, uh, in further detail what each level of risk and the frequency um, affects, how that affects the um, level of risk. Now we're looking at the uh, next step in the process, which is we're looking at the hand distance from the lower back. So importantly here, use the graphics when you're looking at someone carrying out a lift. And what you're looking for here is the blue part, the part of the arm that is highlighted in blue. So if the upper arm is in line with the torso, we assign it a colored green and a score of zero. If the arm, upper arm is slightly away from the torso or more, then we will go for an amber and a three. And if it is arms are fully outstretched uh, or the upper arms angled away from the torso and the torso is bent forward, then we're going to give it a rate, a color code of a north, red, and a score of six. Then we look at the vertical lift zones. So here we'll see if the hands are between knee and elbow height, with a green and a zero, and they go into the, the columns. If it is hands are between uh, knee and floor level, um, or hands are between elbow height and head height, well, then it's a number and a one. Um, and if the hands are at, at floor level or below floor level, or the hands are above head height, it's a red three. Now, two little comments on this one. I'm going to ask you all to think of where would you rate a, and a, don't, please don't answer this in chat box or otherwise, I just want you to think, where would you uh, rate someone lifting a box, the last box from a pallet? So there's a pallet on the ground, a pallet on the ground and the box is on the pallet. Based on that guide, hopefully you've all uh, assigned it an amber one. So that's where that would fall. Now, what you'll also notice here is for the vertical lift zone, the red score is three. When we look at the hand distance from the lower back, the red score is six. So these scores are weighted based on the contribution each risk factor makes to musculoskeletal ill health. Then we look at torso twisting and sideways bending. Again, look at the graphics. You assign your, uh, your, your color and your score. And uh, here you'll see the red is a maximum score of two. Then we look at postural constraints. And postural constraints, 
are something that causes the individual or the worker to modify their posture uh, because and their movements are restricted because of their environmental conditions or their space available to them. Um, so, uh, for example, going through narrow gaps or having a very disorganized workplace. And here we talk about um, if the posture is severely restricted, we score it uh, uh, three. If it's just, um, again, it's subjective as to what's restrictive, but I'll put that into perspective for you. Um, if someone has to work in a cramped condition in the cold of an aircraft, that would be severely restricted posture. Then we look at the grip, and again here, we would assign based on the whether there's fit, um, fit for purpose handles, or whether there's handholds or the palm grip, or whether it's as shown there, that there are no handles or handhold, and it's it's a, a, a difficult to grasp situation. Again, we'd score there an amber, green, amber, or, or red. We then also, of course, consider the floor surface. So we're working through the process flow now. We go to the floor surface and we see if the, we assess whether or not the floor is damaged, whether there's it's dry or clean, um, um, or whether it's it's uh, extremely slippery or there's severe damage, and we score accordingly. And then we look at environmental factors. Now, here, what we should need, what I should emphasize is that an environmental factors that we're looking at are those that would have an impact on musculoskeletal ill health. So they might, the extremes of temperature. So if someone is extremely cold, of course, that's going to potentially impact their musculoskeletal health if they're um, lifting something because they'll start to lose the, the feeling in the tips of their fingers. Um, and that might impact how they grasp something, or if they're extremely hot, again, their energy levels might be less, they may not have the same muscular capacity for lifting, um, or indeed, if there's poor lighting, that also can result in someone not being able to see in front of them. But one factor that people often consider here is noise. Noise is an environmental safety risk factor, but it doesn't affect musculoskeletal ill health. So therefore, if there's noise in the area, I don't include that as an environmental factor when I'm rating a lifting task. So before we go to now it's your turn, and I know that was a little bit of a whisk stop, but I don't think there's anything better than you physically trying and working through the process yourself. So before we go to the video, I'm going to suggest we're going to take that comfort break. So literally it's 12.08 and we're going to kick back off here very unusually at 12.13. So a five minute comfort break for everyone. Please take a leg stretch and we'll see you back here at 12.13. And just while everyone is taking a break, or otherwise, Hugh, if I could ask you, this this would be perfect time to get our video set up uh, for the lifting task, and we'd be using that as uh, for our next part of our workshop. Okay, um, I gotta take presenter back though, and then just roll us forward one slide so I can share my screen. Is that all right? Oh, actually, just want me to. I'll take no, no. Let me move these. It must put one on there. There you go. Perfect. And which one is it first again, the lifting? It's the lifting operation. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you. Okay. So hopefully there are very few listening to us that you've all taken a leg stretch.
you're all very welcome back. Hopefully you've had your, your leg stretch and you have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea in hand. So uh, Hugh, if I could ask you now to um, prepare the video. So on this one, what you're going to see is an individual lifting boxes. So we're, uh, you need to consider which of the um, assessment guidances you're going to use within the Mac tool. And then um, I'm going to ask you to try and complete uh, page 20 of your, um, the score sheet on page 20 of your workbooks. Now you'll see, and you can roll it there, uh, Hugh, please. Um, I was nearly there going to say, roll it there, Colette, and show my age. So, very importantly, we need to observe, observe, observe. So as you'll see, written on the box is the actual weight of the box. And of course, that's very important. I, I should mention that, that when you're when you're filling in the score sheet and identifying uh, or explaining the task, always include the weight and frequency or any and any unusual situations in relation to the load, whether it's not uniform or um, uh, sharp edges or otherwise. So we're li he's lifting a 25 kg box. We don't know the frequency just yet. Now that's going to come up on the video in a few moments, but you're going to see the task repeated a couple of times before you get the frequency. And if the frequency isn't readily known, very simply throw on your timer on your on your phone, um, or if you have a video, count how many lifts they do in the minute or the the twenty seconds or or whatever. Um, so we want to see it again now. So we have a twenty five kilogram lift, and that is going to be done every nine to fourteen seconds. So to fill in the load weight frequency, you're going to look at page three of your workbooks and where on the graph are you going to identify a 25 kilogram lift that's carried out once every nine to 14 seconds. And based on what you're observing and what you see on your guidance document there at page three, you fill in your uh, color under the lift column, opposite load weight and frequency, and the appropriate score four columns over under the numerical score under the lift again. And now I want you to continue and go to the hand distance for the lower back, which is the next page of your workbooks there on page four. And here you should be taking the worst case scenario. This is not when he's taking all the boxes from the top uh, layer on a pallet. You need to consider what's the worst case scenario during the lift. And that, of course, is when he's lifting at the very bottom of the pallet. I now want you to score the vertical lift zone. So where is he lifting in respect of the floor height? And give that a score and a color as well. And thankfully, he's doing a, a horrific job of lifting. So he's given us a good, good um, uh, data here to do our assessment. So, and our torso twisting and sideways bending. Give me a score there as well for the torso twisting and sideways bending. And now look at tell me if there are any postural constraints that you might believe. Um, is there anything there that is restricting his posture? Score that. We're now moving on to the grip on the load. So based on, and again, we're on page six now of your, your workbooks. Score for your grip on the load and color. And of course, now we're in difficulty because our next um, uh, risk factor is floor surface, and we can't see the floor surface. And that's why it's very important when we're doing um, any risk assessment, ergonomic or otherwise, we really need to see 
in person what's going on. Um, so we can't see it here. We have to presume in this case that the floor surface is non-slip, dry, clean, firm and level. level. So and we're going to score that a green and a zero. And then let me see, what do you think if there's any environmental factors there in terms of light or wind or otherwise? And you'll see as you go through the carry distance, obstacles en route and communication coordination, they're blocked out on your score sheet because they obviously don't apply when you're lifting. They only are scored when someone is carrying, which is the next task. OK. So uh, Barry, I'm going to ask us to go back to the presentation again, please. And now we're going to look and see, compare your scores to the um, uh, scores that were completed by uh, the HSE. So let's see how you did. I'd like you to do a quick compare and contrast on the scoring. So red six, yes, 25 kgs, one nine to 14 seconds. The R6, again, the hands were um, uh, away from the lower back. Vertical lift, bottom layer of palate, amber two. There was a lot of twisting, red two. Postural constraints, amber one, because he was in behind the conveyor. Grip was an amber one, which is your standard pal um, panel grip. Floor surface was green and zero and no other environmental factors. So now, that will help us to identify where do we need to focus? This is a high risk activity. We uh, should start our focus first by looking at the color. So we focus on the reds and the, then we look at the number. So we need to look at the load weight and the hand distance from the lower back. So when we're identifying our corrective action, that's what we focus on. So we always start with the color first and then the score because you'll see that you have a red two and an amber two. The red two is the one we should focus on above the amber two. Hopefully you uh, found that uh, exercise um, worthwhile and you got to, to be a little bit, little bit more familiar with the um, uh, process flow and following the um, assessment guide. But we're going to do another one. So we're going to looking now at the carrying operations. So we're going to look at the red um, uh, topped section of your workbook. So that's on page eight. And the uh, guide or the process flow for that is on page 12. So it's a slightly different um, consideration here. So we're going to start again with the load weight frequency. But as you'll see on page eight, the load weight frequency table for carrying is a slightly different shape to the load weight frequency guide for lifting. So that's why it's very important that you use the right guide for the right um, part of the task. So here we look again, same thing. We look at the weight first, then how frequently it's done. And based on that, we will score for a, a, a score a number and a color code. And in this case, we'll be filling in the the um, middle column under color band. So we're live, filling in the carry and then four or three over, we'd be filling under the carry under the numerical score. So very same graphics here. You're looking at the um, upper arm and it's relative relativity to the uh, torso. Now we have a slightly different thing we need to consider for the carry. Here we're considering where is the load being carried? Is it in front of the body? Is it asymmetrically to the side? Or is it a two-handed asymmetric? So based on that, we'll again assign a color and a score. And again, we look at posture constraints. So we've gone from, uh, we're on a D on the process flow. So um, again, here, what we're looking at is uh, factors that force the worker to modify your posture. So that might be, if there's restricted, if there's restricted access, for example, a narrow doorway that forces the person to turn or move the load to get through. The um, and if that's the case, it's a uh, number one. Or if it's severely restricted, having to bend to carry in, in an area with a low ceiling, that would be a red three. The guide for carrying the, the grip is the same, so we're looking at the same graphics uh, for the grip and the same scoring. And here we're looking at the floor surface again. And again, we're looking at whether it's clean and dry, similar to the lift. 
But now we have to consider the carry distance because that has a factor uh, or um, contributes to the risk when you're carrying as to how far you have to carry something. If it's a short distance, zero to 10 meters, green, uh, sorry, two to four meters, I beg your pardon, four to 10 meters, amber, over 10 meters, we're in the red. Now, as you've seen here, we're not using angles. We're not expected to use heights of measurement and physically measure them out with the measuring tape. We're using elbow um, reference to the head, etc. Similarly here, you're not expected to measure out two to four meters. It's an estimate or step it out if you're if you're unsure. Um, but it's literally it's in and around is what we're talking about here. This is what, what why Frank mentioned that these are very uh, user friendly tools. Now we look at another thing um, in relation to carrying only, and that is obstacles. So obstacles on route. And um, importantly here, what we're looking for are types of obstacles. So if the person has to carry um, around uh, or through a closed or narrow doorway, and there's four of them on route, that's considered one type of obstacle. So then it's a number two. But if they have to step over a um, a platform and then go through a door, then we have two different types of obstacles. So it's not the number of obstacles, it's a number of types of obstacles that we are um, addressing here. And of course, importantly, a mistake some people make when we're doing this is, and you're going to see it in the next video, and I'm going to ask you to keep an eye out for it, which is the um, uh, individual carrying out the carrying activity has to dock beneath um, pipe work. But we have already considered that in terms of the postural issues. Um, it won't be considered an obstacle. So if we've already assessed pipe work above head, we don't include it a second time when we're doing the assessment. Um, if we haven't, we then will include it, but we don't duplicate and call something an obstacle and uh, something that's going to cause cramped posture. Similarly, with environmental factors, strong winds, etc., um, and we rate accordingly. So I'm going to ask you again to now it's your turn. So we're going to uh, you're going to again be filling in your your score sheets um, and go through each of the risk factors that applies to the carrying operation. So I'm going to um, be handing over to Hugh again to show us the video. And we have our same guy, but this time he's taking the boxes off the end of the conveyor. And we'll wait uh, to have seen it three times before we we'll see the weights and the frequency again. So obviously the weights are the same. There's a piece that is placed onto the conveyor. Now, what you will notice here that it takes a few seconds even to establish what exactly you're looking at. So that's why it's important. You need to spend time observing what is going on with the task before you actually physically start the assessment. So. Quite a tall, tall gentleman. Now, importantly here, at the end of this lift, or sorry, carrying operation, he's lowering the boxes onto the floor at the other end. That's a separate assessment. So for this full activity of taking boxes from a pallet, putting them onto a conveyor, carrying them from the conveyor to the end of the corridor and placing them on the ground, you would do three MAC assessments. You do one MAC assessment for lifting from the pallet onto the conveyor. You'll do a second MAC assessment for the carrying from the conveyor. One every 20 seconds as is coming up there to the end of the corridor. And then you do a third MAC assessment for lowering onto the ground. 
So the lifting and lowering are the same as um, uh, uh, guidance doc guidance on in your workbooks. So based on that, I'd like you now to start looking at the guidance for the car um, carrying operation, page eight, and write down in your workbooks um, the score and the color for lifting 25 kgs every 20 seconds. Okay, I now want you to look at the guidance for the hand distance from the lower back. So again, make sure you're on the red banner across the top and you're page nine. So hand distance from the lower back here. So look at the upper arm here. And importantly, what we're looking here is, is the upper arm in line with the torso? If, and um, if you think it is, you give it a green zero. Um, we now look at its asymmetrical torso loading. So this is where we capture the fact that the arm is out to the side. The upper arm out to the side is not the same as having the upper arm in front of the torso. So when in line with the torso would be a green zero, and then we capture the fact that the arm is out to the side when we're doing no C there, which is the asymmetrical uh, torso or load. Now I want you to identify if there's any postural constraints. So in that activity, is there anything that forces this guy here to modify their posture? Is there their movements restricted by anything? Now I want you to look and score the grip on the load and into your workbooks. And now, from a floor surface perspective, we have a little bit more better view of the floor there. So looking at the conditions of the floor, would you say it's non-slip, dry, clean, firm, level and undamaged? In which case, G in the uh, column for carry under color band and zero in the numerical score. Or if it's mostly dry, amber, etc. Then we look at the carry distance. Now, again here, I'm sorry, Hugh, I'm going to ask you actually, we, we, that's the, the solution. If I could you just return the video to the beginning one more time for me, please. And I just want to cover, thank you very much, Hugh, the uh, carry distance. Now here again, you're not expected to measure it out. What distance do you reckon he's carrying it? Is it between four and 10 meters, less than four meters or greater than 10? So an estimate of that. Obstacles on route. So here again, we're looking for the types of obstacles. So if there's none, it's green zero, one type or steep slope, it's amber two. Or if there's ladders or at least two types of obstacles, it's around three. And then environmental conditions, are there extremes of lighting or um, the uh, uh, strong wind conditions or otherwise, we'll capture that there. So, Hugh, thank you very much for that. I'm ask, going to ask you to please put me back to the PowerPoint again. Thank you very much. And now what I'm going to ask you all to do is to compare and contrast uh, your scores with those of the HSEs. So, Amber 4 is what we got on load weight frequency. I think uh, most people will probably have gotten that. The hand distance from the lower back this is where uh, I, I would say that some people have scored that. And um, what I'd like to say here is that the hand out to the side is, uh, the hand might still be, and if you can see me there, the hand still might be in line with the torso, even though it's out to the side. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the upper arm in line with the torso. So the upper arm is in line with the torso, even though it's out to the side. And um, so it's a green zero. Then we capture it, it's holding it in one hand asymmetrically, so it's A1. Postural constraints, it's uh, under, going under the pipe work is a one postural constraint, so we score that in amber one. And then the grip on the load is our amber one as well, it's your standard panel grip there. Floor surface, we're giving green zero. We 
estimate there between four and 10 meters for a carry distance. So we're saying an amber one there. And the obstacles en route, we're saying there's two different types of obstacles there. It's there's um, trip hazards and then there is a narrow doorway. And then we have uh, no other environmental factors that we're aware of, of course, difficult when you're using a, a video. So we're now going to look, we're not going to do this an exercise on this. I'm very conscious of time, but we are, I'm, I'm going to talk you through very briefly the third guidance for Mac, which is for a team handling operation. So I'm going to ask you to go to the teal covered top of your workbooks and go to page 13. And again, we have a process flow. We're going to assess the load weight, the hand distance, vertical lift zones, etc. So when it's a more than a, a single person lift, if it's a two person or a team lift, well then we use we only assess the load weight. And based on how many people are lifting and the total weight that is being carried between all the members of the team. So if you have uh, three people carrying 150 kgs of weight. Where would you put that? So have a look at that and tell me where, and so don't tell me a bigger part, just think to yourselves, three people carrying 150 kgs. And hopefully you've identified that as a P10. And uh, that again would be something that should be um, rectified immediately off the Richter scale in terms of a very high risk. Then we look at the hand distance from the lower back. Now here with the team lift, remember you will be looking at more than one person. So you're looking at the worst case scenario. If one person is carrying out the lift with their arms in line with their torso, and as a consequence of that, the other person has their arms extended in front of them, well then you score that based on the person that you're seeing with the arms extended. Uh, the vertical lift zones, again here, that can change if you have two um, individuals or more uh, who are not evenly matched in terms of stature. So if you have one of a smaller stature and one of a very tall stature, for one person it might be lifting over their head, for the other person it might be below head height. So you are assessing this risk based on what you're, the worst case you're observing. Similarly, here with the torso twisting and side bending, worst case, of uh, the two or more individuals who are involved in the lift. The postural constraints are the same as for the other um, two situations, the, the lifting and the carrying. The grip on the load, again, same. You're looking at the same types of graphics and same scoring as for lift and carry. Floor surface is the same, carry distance is the same. Obstacles en route, same, we're looking at the types of obstacles there. But we have a new risk factor that we need to include when we're just involved in a team lift, and that is the communication coordination and control. And that's a critical element of um, a team lift, that there is somebody who is in control of the lift, there's somebody who is doing the countdown, and uh, the one, two, three lift scenario. Um, and again, you'll see that when you're observing um, um, a team lift as to whether someone starts off before the other person or someone has the, the whatever's being lifted up before the other person starts to, uh, to even uh, get into the correct position for, for lifting. And then we have the other environmental factors as well, same as for the other um, lift guides. So what do we need to consider? We need to consider, does the manual task, ta handling task need assessment in the first place? So if it's a light task, infrequent, then manual handling uh, assessment is not required. Um, does the task require a full assessment? So therefore, what I mean by that is, is there someone with a particular predisposition? Um, is there, uh, are there extremes of uh, reach or lift uh, or heights that need to be applied? So is the MAC suitable? And then if the MAC is suitable, which of the tools are you going to use? Are you going to use the lift, carry, or team guidance? And there may be more than one assessment carry required. So there might be a single task might involve lifting and carrying. You're doing two assessments for that. And if the loads vary, for example, in distribution centers, there is a, um, a, a varied MAC, it's called a VMAC, which will give you some uh, indication as to the overall level of risk. And that can be used by combining 
individual MAC assessments, and that is available also on the HSE's website. The purpose of the assessment, as it says, is to identify and reduce the overall level of risk and then to put measures in place to control the risks that you have identified. And that's the critical element. On that, I will um, give leave if there are, I just should say just there's notification here recently from the HSE in the UK that um, they have an online version of the uh, Mac art and rap tool that can be done. Um, uh, and you, unfortunately though, you won't be able to record the um, or to save your your assessments, but it does make the assessment a little bit easier. And um, also, LCE have a tool called Easy Ergo, which allows you to do use Mac Art and Wrap um, uh, on a, a software platform as well. So, if you have any questions on that, please feel free to contact um, Ita at lce.ie. I'll hand over to Frank. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ita. You can, that, that, that was a very, very interesting uh, uh, presentation and very practical. Uh, you can hold on there and maybe Great. keep your camera on because we're going to do the question and answers. And maybe Christine as well, if you could just turn on your camera again um, uh, for a few minutes. Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose the, the important, uh, the, the last statement really of your presentation sums it all, all up really, Ita. I mean, the purpose of the risk assessment tools is to actually quantify the risks uh, with respect to work practices so that you can look at ways of reducing overall risk uh, by putting appropriate solutions in place. Um, so look at, I'm, uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, so if Christine is there, yeah, Christine, could you put on your, yeah, great, okay. Listen, I'm gonna hand over now, uh, just briefly for about five, 10 minutes for, uh, for a few question and answers. If you have any question and answers, please put them in the uh, question and answer box there and Barry will go through them. Um, uh for the next few minutes so i'll hand over to you maybe barry for this few minutes is that okay that's great frank thanks very much and thanks very much for everybody who sent in questions now the first couple of questions i'm going to direct towards christine evelyn and yasir want to know more about the pods you mentioned evelyn wants to know what's the name of the pods and yasir just wants to know a bit more about the content about what the pods are about okay well we actually designed the pods in house so we had limited space again so we wanted to design little workshop, little workstations that wouldn't take up lots of space within our training room. So we designed them so we could fold them away. We designed them in line with ergonomic principles for VDU um, work. And um, yeah, so basically we just, yeah, we drew up the design. We got prototypes made. We trialed them out, we got people to test them. We made adjustments based on width, height. Um, we looked at overheating, for instance. So we put vents into the pods in case someone left the machine, you know, the VDU on by mistake. Um, they can bolt on and off the wall if IT need to get access to the equipment. Have I answered that enough? That's perfect, Christine. I've just another question though, on the, the platforms that you use. Colette wants to know who fabricated the platforms for you. Oh, um, we used a fabricator. I can't remember their name offhand, but I can forward it to yourself or to Frank, or if you take the person's email, I can let you know. Yeah, I have the person's details here, so I can pass okay, them on to you. Christine. Perfect. Now I have another question here. I think this is probably for Ethan. In consideration of environment, embracing technology and expediency, can RULA, REBA, MAC, VMAC and RAB be used through an integrated management system and to be completed online in real time via tablet instead of a paper and pen method? Well, I have to say that's a very good question and it sounds like it's a setup, but I don't think it is. Um, yes, it, you can use those. Um, uh, there are a number of platforms out, but, but the one I'm most familiar with, obviously, is the Easy Ergo, which is uh, easyergo.com, um, which will allow uh, the assessments to be just carried out in, in double quick time rather than using the, the paper based system. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. That's great. I have another one here for you as well. It comes in from Jean. And Jean wants to know, for the first exercise, can you please explain the score of A2 for C, the vertical lift zone? On my download document, there are three options, G0, or A1, or R3. I can't see or A2. 
A1, it should be. That would be my typo. And I'd be, oh. take my slap on the wrist, well spotted. Uh, you're, spot. getting, you're getting the uh, star prize today for the spotting. No one else <laughs> spotted that, but yeah, you're dead right. It's A1. It should be. Uh, my apologies. I will get that sorted for the next um, uh, week's presentation. That's, 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 all that? the, yeah, that's great. That's all the questions that we've got in so far, Frank. So I can hand back yeah. over to you. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for that, Barry. I think we oh, will sorry, wrap up. Sorry. Sorry, Frank, yeah. I just got one more question in from Mark. From Mark. Mark wants to know, when using two-person lifts as a control, what, uh, what are the most practical ways for an employer to ensure that two-person lifts are carried out at all times? Well, I don't, I, I can take that, Frank, or... Yeah, okay, yeah that's fine. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult one, because if you have a, um, a system or a process that's documented and says that it is to be a two person lift is like any control that it has to be adequately supervised so um whether that is somebody has to wear hearing protection or a lift has to be carried out as a two person lift um that has to be adequately supervised and enforced so if there's a non compliance it should be addressed as the same as any non compliance within the organization uh, but adequate supervision is key to ensuring that control measures that an organization says it's going to implement are actually implemented in in practice. Yeah, can I just add to that as well, Ita? I think uh, it's it brings up an important subject, which is the whole area of audit, auditing and internal yes. auditing. Uh, you hear a lot about internal auditing in companies with respect to quality audits, uh, but uh, I think it is a very effective way of looking at auditing, you know, ergonomic interventions as well to see you know, if what you've actually stated in terms of uh, improvements or changes or method statements are actually happening and uh, that the, you know, if you've brought in new equipment that's been used and uh, used in an appropriate way. Another aspect of that as well is if you are bringing in new equipment or new changes in practices is to involve those that do the job at the very earliest stage. That way you get better buy-in in terms of making sure that the, the actual activities take place properly into the future. So thank you for all those questions. Just, just, uh, just one other thing I'd like to mention. I, I put a link on in the chat forum there uh, to the EU OSHA uh, campaign. It, it, the EU OSHA has a campaign called Lighten the Load, which is targeting uh, prevention of musculoskeletal disorders. So it's across Europe, across 20, 27 member states for the next two years. Uh, and I've given a link to their website campaign page uh, and it, there's a lot of very useful information there. There's also examples of research reports that have been published at EU level. Some really interesting uh, research has been carried out in the last 12 months, uh, looking at issues with respect to, uh, you know, the high prevalence of MSDs across Europe. One of the interesting things that came out of the, 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 the research was that uh, there needed to be more focus on risk management, but also need more focus on good practice and uh, education and awareness around risk assessment tools. So that's why we, you know, we think it's important to do this kind of work. So we're delighted that this, you know, so many people still here at an hour and forty-five minutes later. I'd like to thank Christine, and I'd like to thank Ita, and I'd like to thank you all for participating today. And feel free to, uh, you know, look at our website. I, we sent on links to our website and any other links. Uh, one final thing, just be sure to fill in the survey after you log out of the uh, webinar today and give us your thoughts. So on that note, I think we'll wrap up for today. Uh, I just to let you know, we have two more webinars. We, we have two more risk assessment webinars on the 20th of October for the construction sector and on the 3rd of November for the healthcare sector. And also we have another webinar on the 26th of October, which is really uh, to support EU OSHA campaign where we'll have a number of speakers We'll be covering uh, manual handling, but we'll also be looking at remote work as well. Um, so that's it. So we leave it at that. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day. Take care. Thank you, Frank. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.